the Carolina Conversation. I'm your host, Shimon Williams, and we have a great one here today. And uh, But first and foremost, before we go to our guest, make sure you click or subscribe to the Carolina Conversation on your, your platform, or whatever that may be, Apple, Spotify, and make sure that you subscribe and make sure that you put like and give me comments that are constructive so I can learn to get better at this as uh, it's important that I continue to grow. But I want to introduce an individual that we have today. He's uh, my big brother, and uh, he's been a, a great individual for me learning uh, how to navigate life and also navigate this college prof uh, basketball uh, profession. Uh, he hails from Binghamton, New York. He was a 1987 Mr. Basketball in the state of New York. He was also uh, a 1987 McDonald's All-American. More important, you know, he's a great individual and he's the head coach of Monmouth University. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the King Rise. Welcome, King. Welcome to the conversation, man. How you doing? I'm doing great, man. And I'm looking at your background and that jersey looks sweet, but that degree in the middle, that's what I'm talking yeah. about, brother. And then you right in the middle of it, so that's that's love right there. Yeah. That's love. You know, you you I mean it's not like, you know, I, I had great guys to follow like yourself. Uh, you graduated from the University of North Carolina with a degree in communications. Um, but I want to most importantly, first and foremost, say thank you for taking the time from the Carolina conversation because you have a busy schedule, man. And uh, you did, you did, you had a great, great weekend, great weekend up there as being the head coach at Monmouth University. Uh, had some great wins this past weekend. Um, but uh, you know, how how are things going for you in this COVID pandemic, being the head coach at Monmouth? Well, Shaman, I'm I'm very fortunate um, that. I'm the coach at Monmouth. I have great leadership here. Uh, Dr. Marilyn McNeil, who's our athletic director, brought me here 10 years ago. And I didn't really understand being a head coach. Uh, I had only been an assistant. And when I was an assistant, I had all the answers. I knew I was gonna be just like Coach Smith and I was just gonna tear everybody up. And then you get your opportunity and I started out 0 and 8, <laughs> and then a lot of doubts came in. But as I said, I had great leadership. Um, she's been the athletic director here about 27, 28 years. Um, and when she picked me, it was her. She made the call. And we have a very close relationship. She's been mentoring me. Um, she's helped me along the way uh, just by giving me this opportunity. But during this trying time, you know, with her and then our president, Dr. Leahy, who's been here over a year, um, they've been on the front lines leading. And when you have great leadership, then you feel safe. And when I feel safe, then I can do my job with the team, with my coaches, with the whole campus. And with COVID and on top of it, all the social things that were going on in the country, you know, basketball coaches get put in the front. And... Fortunately for me, I've had great leadership before here with my father and my parents, my high school coaches. But then the time that I had at Carolina, Coach Smith was always on the front line. He always told us to use our voices. So I just tried to reflect on the things that he taught me when I was in school and tried to use that with our players. So we're in good hands here at Monmouth. And I'm fortunate that I learned from one of the best on how to deal with 18 to 22 year olds, especially in trying times. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's noteworthy for sure. Um, they have a great individual in yourself because you, you have an extensive background in, uh, in a diverse background in dealing with people. And uh, I think a lot of times people don't take that into account uh, coaches or point guard. Cause when you're a point guard, man, you got, you got a lot of people that you have to deal with. And so we're going to get into that a little bit later. Um, but we want, to, we want to first go back to 1986, 87. What made King Rice 
New York's Mr. Basketball want to come to the University of North Carolina? Well, first off, when, when I started getting recruited, it, it was mainly Syracuse and Northeast schools. And then mm -hmm. after my sophomore year, we won the state championship. <clears throat> I got a chance to go to five-star camp. And I played very well at five-star. Nobody knew who I was. A coach picked me early in the draft, and they almost didn't let him. But the high school coach from Mount Vernon, who we beat in the state championship, told the coach at camp, whatever you do, get this kid on your team. So I had a great week at Five Star. And I can remember the day when I first got a letter from North Carolina. I was with my friends, we're hanging out. And I came home and I had been getting letters now and people were calling and my name was starting to be recognized a little bit more. And, you know, as a kid, that's, that's a great feeling. So you're feeling yourself a little bit. I knew I had Syracuse and that's where I wanted to go. It was an hour from my house. And then I went home and I got a letter from North Carolina. I got in my brother's car <laughs> and I drove all around town and showed everybody. <laughs> it, it, like, it, I showed, I went to the park that I grew up playing in. I was like, yo, I got a letter from Carolina. Carolina wants me to go to Carolina. Yeah. Because that was one, them in Georgetown was one that, as a kid, you, you say, well, hopefully someday they might recruit me. And all these right. other people started coming pretty heavy, and those two really didn't. So when I got that right. letter around town, and it, it just, it made me feel like I must be doing something right, because you heard the stories that they didn't recruit everybody. If they came to recruit you, it really meant something. <clears throat> So that gave me a, a, a boost. And then um, when I went on my visit, okay, it, it was the day after Halloween. I had to take the SAT in the morning. And I was supposed to go Friday night, but I had the SAT. So I took the SAT. Coach Williams flies up to pick me up. Now, I'm a poor kid from Binghamton. I had only been on airplanes to go to camp. Um, right. Didn't really like it. Uh, I had been on another visit, so I had been on an airplane then. Coach uh -huh. Williams flies up in a private plane, picks me up. We fly down there together. <clears throat> we go straight to the football game, and they bring me up to Coach Smith's boot box up at, uh -huh. in King. And Phil Ford is in there, and Phil Ford Sr.'s in there. And those were the first two people that I got to say hello to. So then I'm like, they must really think I'm a baller if they let me meet Phil Ford. And I got to meet his daddy. <laughs> and I got to meet his daddy. So I was, yeah. I was feeling pretty good at that point. But then the weekend, when, when you go on other visits, it's fun. It's, it was cool. It was the first time I was really getting to get away from home. But on that visit, you just, it just felt different on um, the, the, the togetherness with the guys, how they all hung out together, um, how, how they all talked to me about what was going on with me, not just saying, come to North Carolina. They talked about their stories when they were being recruited, some of the good ones, some of the bad ones. And it just, it truly felt different. And while I was on that visit, then I went to church with Coach Smith in the morning. Um, Rick Fox was on a visit the same weekend. He's telling me he's probably going to Indiana. I'm telling him I'm probably going to, to Syracuse. But we have a great time. I go to church with Coach Smith in the morning. And then before they brought me to the airport, I said, I just, I, I want to go to the store. I want to go to the store. Now, on my other visits, I didn't buy anything, okay? At Carolina, I bought me a white hat that had North Carolina on it, and I bought a T-shirt. Uh -huh. We didn't have money like that, so we probably the the $22 that I saved up forever to go on this visit. And right. um, so I think right then I knew that's where I was going to go. Um, I knew it would be hard to say no to Syracuse because I was tight with their coaches. I had been to so many games. Um, but when I was on the visit, I just knew this was the place for me. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, uh, <laughs> And being on a being on a, a recruiting visit with Rick and and so on and so forth and 
Uh, JR talked about, I guess, playing with you previously at the five star, seeing you one time at five star, or something like that, and uh, what he thought about you as a player, and so on and so forth. So after you made the decision to go to the University of North Carolina, when you finally got to campus, when you finally got down here, man, tell me, you know, how was it for you to get acclimated? You know, how was that? How was that for you? You know, leaving New York um, and then coming down here to the South, it being a little, probably a little bit more slower, but um, you know, a different culture. You know, how were the, how were those things for you? Well, the the things that that were great is that when you when you go down there and you're on a team, you have the older guys on the team. So I already had what I, I would call brothers. Okay. Right. Um, I immediately, and it's funny because Rick, Rick ended up committing, obviously, and we called Coach Smith like 10 minutes from each other. Rick called and committed. I called Coach right after, and he was like, this must be my lucky day because Rick Fox just called and said he's coming too. All right, so <laughs> <laughs> Rick and I Had were at y'all spoken thing. about it before you committed? Or you just no, no, we, we, we <laughs> met at camp. Um, we played really well together at camp. Some of the schools were recruiting both of us, but Carolina was the main one. We went on a visit together and we had a lot of similarities being that we're both biracial dudes. Um, mm -hmm. His dad being from the Bahamas, my dad being from Barbados. Um, mm -hmm. And then both of our moms being white. And, um, you know, so we had some things already. Um, right. You know, he, just, just those things in common. Then we both go on a visit the same weekend. That was probably the coaches putting us together like that. And then just after that, I didn't talk to Rick again. And then coach told me he committed on the same day as me. And then, um, you know, obviously we get to school, so we're tight already. Rick and right. I, we started talking, getting to school, and we all looked up to JR because JR was the biggest high school dude when we were in high school. And then the freshman year he had, so I probably tried to follow behind JR a little bit too much away from basketball. <laughs> I probably, probably was trying to be cool thinking because I was with JR, that'd make me real cool. But he oh, only yeah, you both, to me. Most definitely going to be cool with JR now. <laughs> but he only referred to me as freshman. So we'd be around girls and he'd be like, come on, freshman, we got to go. You know, and stuff <laughs> like that. But my first day there, Okay, I pull up, right. I have a bad haircut. JR starts picking me. Kenny Smith is laughing, right? And then about an hour and a half later, they're like, hey, young fella, we going to the gym to see what you got. And I'm thinking, this my job, all right? I'm getting ready to show y'all what I got. But I was an 18 year old kid and Kenny was the number seven pick, <laughs> okay? Right. right. Kenny showed me that there was a reason I was a freshman, and there was a reason he was a top pick that year in the draft. And my right. first day there, he made me fall down. This would be no coaches around. This was just the guys right. come to the gym, play pickup, and Kenny right. Smith made me fall down. I was like, uh-oh. And then I thought I was going to get in the lane and do what I always did. That's what I do. And right. I got in the lane, and I went to the hole and got around Kenny, went to lay it up. And Warren Martin blocked my shot without jumping. <laughs> All right, on top, my first shot, he was on top of the ball and just brought it down to the floor and they fast break that I, I might have even fell down. Right. I was like, that never happened to me in my life. Like, I fell down, right. Kenny shook me and I fell. And Warren Martin blocked my shot where he didn't jump. And I used my best stuff. And it was like, right. whoa, 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 wait a second. But it was my first day, so I'm thinking, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. Two days later, Lebo comes in the gym. And I've been waiting on this one. I'm like, yo, yeah. I'm going to get him extra. <laughs> and when Jeff comes in the gym, all the guys start going, Lord Lebo, Lord Lebo. And I'm looking, Lord Lebo? That's just Jeff. Yeah. But they all call him Lord <laughs> as his nickname. And I'm like, well, I'm getting ready to tear him up for sure. Kenny's a pick, but I'm going to get Jeff. And it was like the whole gym knew what was about to happen. 
Debo scored all seven points for him. All seven. They were setting screens for him. He was running around, shot faking. I jump. Then he go lay it in. They were all laughing. He scored all seven points, and then they got me off the court. Right. So then it was like, whoa, this is this might take a minute. And then when right. the coaches got involved, you know, I knew I could guard. I knew um, I could get people to ball, but I knew it was going to take me some time to truly. I knew right then it was going to take me some time to to figure this thing out, and I better be ready to get in the gym. It was cool because the older guys put their arms around you and said, hey, we all went through this too. Keep your That's confidence right. up. Don't start tripping. Just keep your confidence up and do what coach wants you to do. Um, I got yeah. in great shape so I could do all the running and all the stuff that you have to do when you get there. But it truly was the first time in my life that I didn't have maximum success. Like first time in anything I ever did, I always had a lot of success playing football, baseball, basketball was my thing. Um, just never had done it, never dealt with anything like that. And mm -hmm. then what, what the hard part was, I didn't realize how much I counted on my father to, to work with me when I had a bit off day. My dad would be right, right there, I'd be like, yo, son, what's wrong? I you didn't look right today. And I'd be like, dad, I'm okay. And we talk through it and he'd be like, all right, man, well, we'll see how it goes tomorrow. And just that support. And you think I'm a man now, I got to deal with this by myself. And I, I probably should have reached out to home more because I was a long way away from home. <clears throat> and I never had been away from home before. You know, so I was doing a lot of fronting. Like I, I had a control of this whole thing. Um, right. And, and truly, didn't have any control of it because I, I started doing things that I had never done before, okay? I was a guy that never drank alcohol. I was a guy that didn't go to a lot of parties, okay? I was a guy that was working to make the pros. I was from a right. poor family and that's what I was gonna do. And then I picked Carolina. You make the pros when you go to Carolina, okay? Right. And I, that was like, okay. You know, I'm going to do the same thing <clears throat> and struggled with it, a lot of off the court things early, thinking I was cool, thinking I, I could handle anything. And mm -hmm. like I said, started drinking and, and uh, doing some things I probably shouldn't have been doing and had never done it before. So I was way out of bounds from anything I had ever done instead of turning to my support group my mom and dad, the coaches, and just saying, hey, these guys are good too, <laughs> okay? Yeah. This isn't a, a setback. These guys are good too. You're a freshman. In your mind, you thought you were going to be the starter, but no one told you that, okay? Right. And now you got some work to do. So it ended up being great, but it took me yeah. some time to navigate None. through not having success for the first time. No question. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up, King, because uh, I've always thought about this myself, uh, being a former player and, and, and always being around the program and watching kids matriculate through the institution and the program. I think that's one thing that a lot of people don't take into account um, because North Carolina, you, you do recruit the best players in the country and you have that opportunity. And so these kids, are they're still kids, but they're so used to having so much success. Uh, they've always had success and been those individuals. And a lot of times, this is the first time that they will face adversity. And I don't think that people give that enough thought to what these young men are dealing with or have to deal with. And, and for you to, to, to be um, extremely honest with us, and, and, and state some of the things that you dealt with and being able to recognize those things. You think about how many kids throughout the program that, that, that have been on that same level as you, but having to come to North Carolina and experience, quote unquote, I call it basketball adversity, um, because there's other talented guys just like you or guys that have more experience than you. Yeah. You know, you may be better than them at, on that spectrum as a freshman, 
but your opportunity isn't going to present itself because they're still there and they understand the environment. They, they can navigate the ins and outs. Right. Um, so it, it's something to be said that, that you bring that up uh, about a support system and, and having to deal with adversity and, and trying to belong and, you know, and finding yourself doing things that you, like you said, you, you possibly wouldn't have done had you had gotten that immediate success. So how does that help you now, you know, as a, as a head coach, dealing with, you know, knowing what you've experienced and then being able to identify that or being able to have some empathy for your kids that you bring in that may experience the same things? Well, what, what I try to do is we, we recruit the whole family. Um, right. I, I, we call your parents before we call you. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's important. I, I think these kids today, because you can reach them so many different ways and you see a kid at a gym and you go, wow, he's really good. I want him. And then you just reach out. Well, to me, that's weird. Okay. He's a kid. Yeah. He's a kid. That's so right. I'm a grown man calling somebody's child. That's right. That's first, exactly. okay? <laughs> and so we reach out to the parents. We try to find out who we should call. Um, we call the AAU coach. We call the high school coach. But we call the parents first just to say, how you doing? My name's King. I'm the coach at Monument. I watched your son at this tournament. <clears throat> but I want to call you before I call him. Just That's to right. let you know, here's what we're thinking. Here's what I saw. You know, this is what we're trying to do at Monmouth, and we'd love to start building this relationship. But I'm always right. going to call the parents first, just because I think when a kid's receiving calls from coaches that he sees on TV, or just any college coach, and the coach calls, you're gonna feel some kind of way as a kid. You're gonna feel like you, you're doing something, and right. your parents might be raising you a different way and they they don't want you feeling that way they want to keep things under control they don't want you to get a big hit they don't want outside people in their business so you know we we talk to the parents first get permission basically to call the kid and then we explain to the kid what we saw how we do it um we build a relationship before we just offer a scholarship because Coaches just start offering, offering, offering. And would you take that kid if he said yes right now? Well, right. it's not just about ball, okay? Right. I know I don't, I don't fit work for everybody. Some people might see how I do and say, that's not for me. Well, right. if we don't build a relationship first, then we'll never know. So yeah. I, I always build with the parents um, and we recruit the whole family. And we encourage our parents to call whenever they want, okay? When I first became a head coach, a lot of people would tell you, King, you can't talk to the parents, man. Parents be calling you all the time and all the time. Well, I'm a parent. That's right. right? I'm a parent, and okay, if I'm sending my son somewhere, I got to trust the person I'm sending him to. So... I should be able to talk to that person whenever I want, if I'm sending my child to him. That's okay, right. so if that's how I feel as a dad, how can I tell a parent, I'm calling you early, but once you send your son to me, you can't call me anymore and talk about basketball. Yeah. Okay, and that's how it's been for a long time. We broke all that down here. Okay, you can call me anytime. Because most of the time what happens is your son is scared to tell you he's not having success the way you told him he was going to have, the way all the reporters told him he was going to have. He was going to be the savior of the program, and now he can't remember what we're doing. Okay, right. so he's not the savior, and now he thinks people are messing with him because he's not balling anymore. Okay, and it happens to a lot of kids, and they need their parents. And I tell them, call your kid a lot. <laughs> especially when you first drop him off. When he's comfortable, you'll hear it in his voice. You'll be able to tell first, my son is in the place he needs to be mentally, he's good. If you don't talk to them, you, you'll lose track. And then they'll be scared to tell you, dad, this guy's been out playing me every day. They won't even know how to say it. 
And then they'll be telling you, I'm getting busy and the coach don't play me. All right, so usually <laughs> I tell the kids what it is already. Then they deliver the wrong message to their parents and then parents come and their son is sitting on the bench and now they want to be mad at you when all it is is your son didn't tell you the truth. He, didn't, he couldn't tell you, Dad, I'm going to play about four minutes if right. I get that many. If that, he also didn't right. tell you he was late six times. He didn't do what he was supposed to in school. He, he, right. he talked back and we had to run him, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. He didn't tell you that either. And we, right. you know, there's laws. We can't call and tell on kids, which we would never do. But right. I think it's important that the relationship is strong. So when a parent, I called my dad and said, Coach Smith don't know what he's doing. Dad, Coach Smith don't know what he's doing. I should be playing. And my dad right. said, King, that man's been the coach there 20 some years. He obviously knows what he's doing. <laughs> you obviously aren't doing what you supposed to be doing. Don't call here no more with that, King. Don't call right. me no more and say that. Start doing what you're supposed to do. Right. All right? And that was that. So we try to, we, we keep that relationship with the families because it is a trying time. And it is a lot of times these kids first time away from home. And their parents mm -hmm. play a major role in all the success that they had. And now they're out there by themselves. And now the things that you always said no to is available to you 24 seven. And now, right. did you say no because you didn't want to experience these things? Or did you say no because your parents wouldn't let you? Okay, well, now your parents aren't here. And you're not going to get in trouble if you're out late. And you're not going to be in trouble if you got a lot of people coming in and out of your place. Are you still able to say no? Because right. if you don't, then you get going faster than you've ever gone before. Okay, right. so... With our team, we're very involved, okay? We're very involved. We talk to them about all the pitfalls all the time. I've told my story a million times, um, mm -hmm. just about staying who you are, staying grounded to who you are, okay? That basketball does not define you, okay? You That's are right. way more than that. You're way more than that. If you have a bad game, you had a bad game. It's harder now for these kids because everybody can say something now. We have social media. Every time something goes wrong, everybody can say something. I didn't have to deal with that. But I had a support group of old, older players when the fans were really on me. I remember getting a call from Jimmy Black my senior year after I got booed because I turned it over against UConn so much. That was not cool that I got booed, <laughs> okay? I don't care how many times I turned it over. Had a bad That's game, right. but I'm, I'm not a pro. I'm not being paid. I'm your team's point guard. That shouldn't happen at the house. And Jimmy right. called me the next morning, like nine o'clock in the morning. I almost didn't answer the phone. And he just was like, King, that wasn't cool last night, young fella. And I just want to know, I'm supporting you. And you're doing right. your job just like you're supposed to do your job, man. And you keep doing your job just like coach. If you weren't doing your job, coach wanted to have you out there. Don't That's let true. your fans feeling some kind of way about your game last night bother you for one second. And that, that's the type of support that Carolina gives you because an older guy will reach out to help you. Okay. That's and right. that's why I was, I had great teammates, you know, that supported me. Um, I probably should have listened to them about some off the court things earlier, but I wasn't listening then. It was like, I got this. Nobody, I, you're not my father. <laughs> okay, I'm doing it how I want to do now. And, you know, but so now because I've gone through that, I'm, I'm strong with my parents. I talk to the kids about, it's okay if you don't have success. Okay? I thought my whole purpose to that point in my life was I was supposed to make the pros to take care of my parents. Okay, that was our, my whole deal. These kids get way more pressure to make the pros now. My pressure was to get a degree because my dad never had that opportunity. Okay, so he pushed hard. If you get a degree in an education, no one could take that from you. And then you can go and do whatever. 
Okay, the pros would have been the bonus to him. Okay, I thought I'm going to make the pros. I'm ranked really high. I go to Carolina. That was going to be my deal. That was defining me, basically. So when I didn't make it, whoa, whoa, I I failed. Like, whoa, all my boys made it. All right, and then you you go through, and and then I started coaching. I played. Coach Smith made me go play. So then I went to England and showed that I could play, but I was like, I don't really want to play anymore. So I came home. I had one class to finish, got a degree, and I got into coaching. And then early on in this, I saw I could really relate to the kids. I thought that before, but I was like, whoa, I, I, I really, these kids really vibe with me. All right, so then it's like, wow, this is, this is a cool thing to do. So then the, the, you do it a little bit longer, and now it's like, wow, I could be really, really good at this. And leaned on the Carolina family with getting a job with Jerry Green at Oregon. Then the Carolina family leaned on him again and got with Kevin Stallings and truly just learned the business, okay? Learned from Jerry Green, Mark Turgeon was on the staff, um, and then Kevin Stallings taught me so much just about the business. Um, I always could get kids to come to college. Like that part, I, I was young then and guys were remembering when I played. But Coach Stallings truly taught me, you can't just be the guy that can get kids, King. You got to be more than that. And I'm so fortunate because a lot of guys get brought in just to be the recruiters. And the recruiting that I was getting done you know, we beat DePaul on a couple of kids. We beat Indiana was messing with a kid, but we ended up getting them. Um, Georgetown came late on our point guard. Um, you know, so I was having some success with kids that weren't going to Illinois State before that. And right. he was like, you can't just be a recruiter, though. You can't do that, King. You got to understand the whole business. And he worked hard at teaching me this business. He He, he truly... He made me write him letters almost daily in the office so my writing would get better. Because back then you had to write letters to kids, okay? And I wasn't the best writer. And he made me write better, okay? He made me make phone calls to people's parents. When I was 24, I didn't think I should be talking to people's parents that much. Um, I just didn't. I was good with the kids. He had to be good with the parents. He didn't allow me to do that. Um, on the floor. He made me do clinics in front of people. I knew my stuff, but I wasn't good at showing it to people or talking in front of a whole bunch of guys that I thought were really good coaches. So he he really forced me to become a college basketball coach and not just a recruiter. Um, Mm -hmm. And then working with Tim Welsh, who did it a totally different way, helped me see you know what? It's all you you make sure you relate to your kids and kids will do amazing things. Tim was great at putting kids together from all over and just vibing and getting those kids to believe in what they needed to do. And you know, so I just kept trying to get better at that and now I'm sitting here talking to you about being a head coach and what I learned and I got a text from my mom yesterday. Her son, her son's a freshman big man, and he probably scores the ball the best on our team inside. And I probably he should probably be getting about 17 to 18 minutes because the kid can score the ball. And my other big guys right now can't. But my other big guy runs to the rim way faster and gets all the rebounds, and he's a junior. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then I got two seniors that are both one six five and one six four and I'm playing them at the four and five because they're seniors and they're just grown men and we're better when they're in off when even though they're all small. And right. this kid's mom sent me a text and was like how proud she was of her son because he's really doing an amazing job. But then she said, I'm even more happy that he's with you guys. And that means me and JR, and Jamal Meeks, and Rick Callahan, because we're trying to raise, we we tell the parents, you give us your kid and we'll send back the grown-up version. 
okay, of the great young man that you sent us. And we'll have them right on the cusp. They won't be grown men, but we'll have them right there. And at the end of this, we'll all hug and it will be what we all wanted. All right, the basketball is gonna take care of itself. And if your kid does the things he's supposed to, he'll probably have an opportunity after. But I thought I'd have an opportunity too. And it wasn't on the court. Shaman, I'm a way better basketball coach and helping kids than I ever could have been as a player. Right. And, and I'm truly, and this comes from my, my dad's background, I'm supposed to, and then Coach Smith and the people that I've gotten to be around and surround myself with, this has been more of my calling, I think. But I think yes. there's, there's even more. I, I, I think I'm supposed to help people even more than I'm, I'm helping because guys are getting education. They're going back to their communities with college degrees and they're doing positive things. But I think I can do more <clears throat> on the ground level that like people help my family. You know, right. we didn't have anything. We had a dad that was in the church that did the right thing and people let me go to their camps and people would pick me up to take me to file shooting competitions. And there was just so many people at the ground level that helped the family like mine that I can't reach right now. So I know there's more that I'm gonna do while I'm coaching, but also after I'm coaching in the community where I'm from and then, and then branch it out even, even more than that. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's awesome, King. I mean, I mean, you are a great representation of, of our institution. And uh, like, you know, what I, what I appreciate about you is you've always been honest and you've always tried to use yourself in, as an example to help us uh, what to do and sometimes, as you say, what not to do. And uh, a lot of times, you know, that, that, that takes a lot as a, as a person. You have to grow, you have to be confident in who you are, and you have to be able to step outside yourself to analyze yourself to say, hey, you know what? These are the things that I need to do to help others. And, uh, you know, it, it, you know, I, I like to sometimes associate it with being a point guard. You know, like, mm -hmm. you understand about being a point guard, man. You're like, you have so many people that you're responsible for, you know, like, and you feel that way. Like, I gotta, I gotta make sure this dude is cool. I gotta make sure this dude, is, I, I gotta know enough of him to understand his, that I can yell at him or I need to talk to him, you know, and that, that takes, that takes selflessness. That takes caring to understand. I can't talk to him. I gotta say something to him or I gotta use somebody else to get to him. And, and you have to be in that environment. You have to be around that person. You have to spend time. It takes time to understand those things. And so listening to you, you know, I, I, I feel you because, you know, that's, that's who I am as a person. But to understand that, you have to take time to evaluate yourself, mm -hmm. evaluate people. And, and, you know, the one thing that people don't, you know, they may not give you enough credit for is being a leader, a leader of men, you know, and everybody can't lead men. <laughs> that's, that's difficult. <laughs> Most people don't want to do that, but you know, it, it, it takes, it takes a leader of men to, to be honest with himself, because if you can't be honest with yourself, there's no possible way that you can be honest with someone else. Right. You know, like they, they always say, um, you know, the first thing that you need to do if you depend it on something and you're trying to get around it, you have to admit that you're dependent on it. And that's self-evaluation. Once you have self-evaluation and you're okay with self-evaluation, now you can grow. You can mm -hmm. grow. And then once you begin to grow, then you can pull others along and lead. Right. And, and the one thing that I can always say about you is you, you're a leader of men. Because, you know, like I said, there's not many people that I'll listen to, you know, because 
uh, well, let, let me take that back. There's not many people that I hold in high regard that I choose to listen to because I've been able to evaluate them and, 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 and understand that, hey, you know what? They have my best interest. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, no, that's... when a person understands that you have their best interest at hand, then you, you say, you know what? I, I'm, I'm going to listen to that individual. And See, um, I, I, let me, I, I think that's something that, especially with Coach Smith, Shaman, um, mm -hmm. I, people ask me about him all the time, and I and I I always go to Coach Smith. Always gave you the best advice for you. So whatever was best for Shaman, he gave you the best advice for you. Yeah, right. I put him in some tough spots. He still would sit there and give me the best advice for me. It wasn't about right. Carolina basketball. It wasn't about any of that. He'd give me the best. And when someone does that with you, like you said, you you hold him in high regard and you go, wow, he really cares about me. And me having a, a chance to go to North Carolina and, and play with the guys I did and see the history and watch the older guys come back um, and just how they treated us, you know, and, and made us feel special every day. Miss Woods and Angela and Kay in the office when you walked in, they greeted you and you how you doing? And you know, we weren't just basketball players to them. And when we came in, it was like they were our aunties, our aunts, our aunt, you know, and they really, really looked after you. So when I got to meet you guys that came after me, I think there's a responsibility as an older guy, all right? You were a young dude. It's my responsibility to come up to you and say, Shaman, how you doing? King Rice, Carolina man. If I can ever do anything to help you, brother, I will help you, <laughs> okay, when you're young, okay? And, and I do that still to this day. I remember right. meeting Jeff, okay, and Stack, and Rick and them had already met him. And I get to town, and Jeff wants me to play pickup. And I was like, son, I'm not playing against you fools, <laughs> okay? He's like, I've been wanting to get a hold of you since I was young, and I'm like, I'm really old now. I'm not, y'all are not going to have jokes about me trying to play with y'all. I just look right. in shape because I'm a coach and I, I work out with Rick and all this stuff, but I can't play and, and y'all are not, y'all the new and improved, new and improved <laughs> version of Carolina ball. All right, Rick's right. in the pros, he can mess with y'all. Y'all are not right. getting me like that. But right. I got to hang out with them and be around them and talk about things that we went through. And then when Jeff came to the Clippers. I lived in LA. I reached out to him. I made sure he was good. Okay. Just because I had been there for a minute. And, and I think that's what Carolina does. Um, yeah. You know, I, I'm watching stack closely right now. I, 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 I pull for you. Okay. Because there's so much basketball knowledge that if guys get an opportunity Shaman, you could sit in my seat, okay? And you would do a great job. And me and you talked about you being here with us before, okay? And then I look and I say, if Shaman wants to coach, how can, that, like, that has to happen because I've watched you, okay? I see your knowledge of the game. I see what you do with young people when you get on the court with them. I see pros seek you out to try to sharpen their game up. So if you want to coach, I think all of us should be trying to find a way to make sure you get to do that. You know, I say Stack. You know, when, when Stack got the Vanderbilt job, I called everybody I knew there and just said, and not that he needed me to, okay? Right. But Candace is the boss there now. Well, Candace and I were super tight for six years. And I said, Candace, right. I just want to tell you, Stack is one of the best brothers ever. Okay, I can't right. wait till you really get to know him. I said, but make sure he's good. And she said, King, you already know I got him. Okay, right. I sit with Rashid and she teaches me something every time I sit with him, just about being a man. I'm the older one, <laughs> okay? He'll give me advice. King, make sure your circle's tight on these things if you're looking at doing this. Something that I might be trying to 
branch off into that I haven't done before, that he just would help me and give me a He's knowledgeable. Okay. Um, Jeff McGinnis is as good of a coach as anybody in the Carolina family. Okay. Mm -hmm. Every summer I go sit with Jeff and ask him to show me what he does with his kids. Cause I watch his teams play all the time and they're running stuff that's better than what I'm running. Okay. <laughs> so just straight like that. So I, I go sit with Jeff cause that's my man, but I go sit right. with him and just show me what you running, man. Cause I'm going to put it in and hopefully right. when they see my team play, they'll see things that they do. Okay. But I, I, I just think our family is, and, and then when Coach Williams became the coach and everybody was all how everybody was, 1,000% I thought Coach Williams was the perfect person to bridge any gaps that were there. Okay, I just right. thought that. So for me, yeah. I, I was one of the most mad when Coach Williams didn't come the first time. But when he came, I was one of the happiest guys because I knew then our family had a chance to be our family, how it was supposed to be. And right. now the success he's had and built on from Coach Smith's legacy is incredible. And I, mm -hmm. I think the young guys there now, I know they need Sheed. I know they need you. They need JR. They need Stack. Just like we needed Mike and Sam and Walt and Dudley Bradley and Matt Doherty and all them dudes just to come back and just so you know, hey, this is real. This is the That's realest right. family. These guys watch, because we all watch. We watch every game. We kick the TV, we throw stuff, we scream, we cheer all in the first five minutes, okay? <laughs> so we're all watching because we care so much and we sat in those seats like those kids. So us being around them, us, Going back to that town is great for us to see each other. And then it's even better for those kids to see Carolina men supporting them. And then it will help with all that pressure that we talked about being on those kids and being on my kids and That's being right. just on kids in general. Shaman, when you went there, you weren't getting the one and done. You going to the pros, one and done. And if you don't, you're not good. We didn't have none of that. JR could have went one and done, and he didn't have any of that. Now, right. if you're a top kid and you don't get 30 in your first five games, I can't even imagine how these kids are feeling. And then your name was at number seven, and now it's not in the first round. Oh, I like talking about stress. I, like, I, I, I don't know how those kids are dealing with that much being on them on top of pandemic, on top of yeah, social. It's, it's the truth and it's unfortunate. I just, you know, myself, I just try to remind them. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And don't, don't, don't worry how somebody else finished the race. Maybe they got there in a hundred meters, just finished the race, no, <laughs> you know? That's why they need to hit, be around you. That's why college guys need to be around you. This is great yeah. doing this, but you have, you just, you can do a lot of things, man. I got a lot of respect I, for how you do. I, and and I, just yeah. you as a man, you as a dad, um, how you live your life is, is cool for an older Carolina guy to watch too. Because I, I, I think we all learn from each other all the time. And I think the respect that we show each other is the best. I think other people yes. try to copy it and they can't it, like you can't cause it's so genuine. And it, you know, with the guys I've had here, I have JR here now, but I have B Reese and Derek, right. you know, yep. that now they're doing some other things. Derek's an associate head coach at, at Washington state. Um, he's a Carolina guy that tried to get in a few times and, for some reason, some people must have been intimidated. And now he's one of the top coaches in the country. B. Reese right. became a head coach after he came here, and now he's an uh, assistant in the Missouri Valley doing great. All right? And people yes. didn't think, oh, should Brian get a chance? Well, now he's had a chance, and he's been 20, 15 years in this business. So right. there, there's so many guys from our family that 
Donald Williams, what he's done with his AAU program. And this is just guys that I talk to about it. You know, there's just right. so many guys that that can give so much to kids, you know, that can right. give and, and want to give. You know, she coaching right. in high school. Is that not the coolest thing that ever happened? Like, that just was like, come on, man, she don't have to do that. He, he right. did not have to do that at all. And that just shows you he's trying to raise men. Well, we learn from the best, and all of us try to give it back. And, and I think, for me, that's the coolest thing I, as I'm getting older and watching. I'm learning from you. I'm watching you be versatile. I watched you with your family when you came up here, man. And that was like, King, you could do better. <laughs> okay, I got to do better. After watching you with your wife and kids, I'm like, oh, my goodness. I thought I was doing it. That was like when, I, when you were around Hubert. All of a sudden, you start looking. I'm like, man, I got to do better, boy. Hubert be out dadding me over here. I got, I got, I'm tired from being a coach. Hubert done went to be a coach and then went to church and then did all the other things too. And then you came up here and did the same thing. I'm like, I'm at least third on the dad list right now. I got to get better. <laughs> man, you, hey, man, like I said before, King, man, you know, I owe you high regard. First and foremost, because you've always, you've always treated me like a little brother from the first time I met you. And even being out there on the West Coast and coming to L.A., you know, seeing you at the games and talking to you briefly. But, but more importantly, man, just, you know, just the person you are. And, uh, you know, like you said, you look at us and you, you analyze us and how can we be, you know, like, you know, how can you be like us in certain regards? Well, you know, we're, we're always watching you as well, man, because, you know, we're trying to emulate you. And um, the, one thing that I, the one thing that I do appreciate about you more than anything else is how, how you overcame adversity. And when I say adversity, you dealt with some things, but it didn't, it didn't make you, you know, quit. You know, it, it, mm -hmm. it made you stronger. It like, you know, it just, it just morphosized you. Mm -hmm. and, and for a lot of us and the things that we deal with daily, um, just with lifestyles, culture, um, you know, all different types of things you, you deal with through walks of life, there's, there's, there's times that guys can say, you know what, man, I'm, I'm just going to quit. You know what I mean? I'm just, you know, enough of this. I'm just going, I'm just going to move into a different direction where you are the example for us to say, Hey, you know what? I'm bigger than this. You know what I mean? I'm bigger than this and I'm going to, and, and this word me and you relate, I'm going to prove to you, Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm gonna prove to you that I belong. You you may not give me the opportunity, but when you don't, you're gonna look back and you're gonna say, "Hey, you know what? I should have." And and that's what I appreciate about you so much. Like you just you're that guy that that shows, "Hey, man, I I'm bigger than this. I'm bigger than this, and I'm going to show you." that I'm bigger than this. You just give me the opportunity. And, uh, you know, for me daily, you know, it, you know, I, I just, you're the person that I can grasp and, and lean on and say, hey, you know what, shit, you know, <laughs> I thought I had it bad, but this man, this man, it's not what he did, it's the people's perception. Mm -hmm. It was the perception because you're a great individual, you're a great person. He. He beat people's perception, you know, and that's that's hard. That's hard to do in this society. And and so to see you today, you know, to been up there and see how those kids, how you have, you know, hold you in high regard, you know, just that, you know, just what you've been able to do. You said it earlier. Being an NBA basketball player wasn't what God wanted for you. Right. He wanted you to be exactly where you are today. So you can bring other people along. And now here it is. A former NBA basketball player is following you and wanting to have the same resolve that you have to have an opportunity to show people, I'm going to prove to you. And, uh, you know, the greatest thing about it. Huh? No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say the greatest thing about it, just the greatest thing about it. 
if Coach Smith were here today, he would be extremely proud of you, of how you did everything. And, uh, you know, you, we know how Coach Smith held you in high regard, but to see what you've done, not only for yourself, but for your other Carolina brothers, Coach Smith would be extremely proud. And, you know, every day I live my life and what I try to do, King, yeah. that's what I'm trying you know, ah, to do. You know, yeah. I, live for, I live for the Lord, but I want to make Coach Smith proud in yeah. his basketball. And I, I know that's one thing that you, you, you know, if you don't, that's one thing you should be extremely happy about, should make you smile all the time. Coach Smith would most definitely put his stamp, boom, on what King Rice is doing as a human, but and 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 as a head coach at Monmouth University. Man, well, I, I appreciate that, and uh, you know, Shaman, I look at it, and now I'm because I, I was in a situation where you said, "Man, I'm not gonna get a chance." They're not I, like, what else do I have to do? Right. And I remember calling my buddy, who ended up being my agent, Bobby, and telling him, "I don't don't." I don't want to hear about it no more. I'm not getting a job. I'm not getting a job. And I went into practice. And when I got out of practice, I had about seven calls from Bobby. And it was the mammoth job. And he was like, man, this lady wants to talk to you, man. I don't know what the deal is, man. I said, man, I told you I don't want to talk about it no more, man. They ain't going to give me a chance. And he was like, yo, man, she wants you to call her, man. This is real. I was like, where? <laughs> you know, then he told me, and it, it, this is the job I got, okay? And they always tell, and, and just by hiring practices, because I ain't going to say they don't let us, uh, by hiring practices, they keep saying we can't coach, okay? That's just what you keep saying. We can do it all parts of the job, but we can't be the coach. Well, this is my 10th year. Okay, I graduated every kid except for one kid who put his name in the draft. He's still my man, and I got him super close, and eventually I'll be back to 100%. I'm going to have some more graduates this year. We've won two regular season championships. I think I averaged out right now. By the end of this year, I'll be about 16-something wins a season. Okay? And you haven't heard one problem with the program right and that's the guy that you didn't want to give a chance because he did some stuff when he was a kid there's so many young brothers that would do so great in this business just with an opportunity and that's why i try so hard every day to carry myself the right way because i i want more brothers to get an opportunity Okay, because I know what will happen if Shaman Williams is the head coach. Because when we do get an opportunity and it's not just a, the worst job in the league or something like that, we're even overcoming those. Okay, because you get the job that's not the great job and then, then they say you couldn't coach. We're taking those jobs and getting through those and getting to new jobs. Okay, so there's this, if there's opportunities, you are going to get one. And when you get your opportunity, you are going to hit a grand slam because who you are as a man. And please don't ever get discouraged about it because the knowledge and just keep giving your knowledge the way you're giving it. Because someone is looking for Shaman Williams, just like Dr. McNeil was looking for me. Okay, there was 100% how my interview went with her. I sat down with her and I said, all the stuff you read about, I did it. I did every single thing. I did it. I did it. There's nothing on there that I did not do. I did all of those things. I said, but I said sorry for him 18 years ago. 18 years ago, I went on TV. I said sorry on TV. I've gotten treatment. I did every possible thing that you could do. I help other coaches. I talk to kids. I've done everything you could possibly do from that point to now. Okay, I'm not apologizing anymore. And she looked at me and she said, well, lucky for you, people think I'm a person that thinks people deserve chances. 
Shemana tighten my tie up, and it's been 10 years now, okay? And as I, it's been 10 years now, okay? And she's still my right hand, and she's mentored me, and she's helped me, and she's shut me down, and she's boosted me up, and I'm a better man because she brought me here, and the people that she put around me to teach me stuff that maybe I should have known before that I didn't know financially and all these things. And now I'm able to be the person that helps even more because of how she chose me. And everybody told her not to, okay? And she interviewed 60 other people. And all the people around here said, not him. And she said me. And now we 10 years in and we've done a lot of positive things here. And now, however it goes from here, I don't have to prove anything to anybody about if I can coach. I prove to myself that, yes, I can run a full college program to a high level, no matter, and I needed to prove that to myself. I didn't, I didn't need to prove that part to anybody else. I had to show myself I could do that. And now, Shaman, I, I truly feel the next 20 years are gonna be even better because now I'm capable of truly helping other people. Before, I was trying to help, but I wasn't in a position to help enough. And that was something Coach Guthridge taught me as a kid. He was like, King, you keep trying to help. The way you're gonna help is graduate. You graduate, then you can help home. You can't help home how you're trying to help home right now. And I used to get mad at him, but he was right. And now on this journey, because of the blessings of the Lord and, and great people in my life and Dr. McNeil looking for me, she was looking for me because I, I, that's how I went at the interview. And now she was tight. She's my boss. She really takes care of me. The school's been taking care of my staff through the pandemic. Um, we're so blessed, um, and now I can help more people. <laughs> so that's, awesome. that's where we're at. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, make sure when you have an opportunity, you check out Monmouth University men's basketball, headed by our great King Rice. They're a great basketball team. They're exciting, and they do a great job. And um, King, we want to thank you again for participating in the Carolina Conversation, bro. Man, you, you, you always, as advertised, man. I appreciate you. I love you, man. And, uh, and God permitting, uh, be able to catch you in a few months, man. Be able to catch you in a few months. But uh, you and JR and Callahan, you guys, man, y'all take care up there. And if I can be of any assistance, man, let me know. Well, I appreciate you, man. I love you. Tell your family we said what up. Please tell Stack. I hope he watches this. Tell him I'm pulling for him so hard every game. All right. Yes. Tell him keep doing his thing. If I can do anything to help him, let, let me know. Yeah. I will do. Will do. Ladies and gentlemen, let's say thank you again to the great King Rod.